Welcome to another episode of Grace Under Pressure. My uh, guest today is Lacey Leon uh, McLaughlin. I uh, will tell you about Lacey in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is the show that poses questions to thought leaders and doers like Lacey, whose ideas and action are changing our world for the better. Grace Under Pressure reveals what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, you know, the caring, the connected, the commitment we exert toward others. Grace for me is the generosity we show, respect we give, and compassion we demonstrate. And when you do it as a leader, we act for the benefit of all to make our culture, our workplace, our family, everything better. So welcome, Lacey. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on our show. So. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. I want to tell the folks just a little bit about you. You are a very, very talented executive coach and talent management professor, uh, professional. And I know that because you headed uh, USC's Center for Organizational Effectiveness for nearly a decade, which is pretty prestigious. Uh, you're also a member of the Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches. And you deal with some of the biggest names, uh, corporate names in America. Um, and you specialize in the entertainment industry, which I find, find endlessly fascinating because my original career was supposed to be in the entertainment industry, but it didn't quite work out that way. <laughs> so, but anyway, so you work with production companies, showrunners, directors, producers, and, um, and you help them, um, do work better with their teams and their work. So, um, welcome uh, Lacey, it's a pleasure to have you today. Yeah, it's great joining you. Thanks so much for making the time. Great. So this question, because we're all in a physically distanced place, um, how's the entertainment industry doing? How is it functioning? So. Yeah. Well, as you know, there's just a huge amount of change. And a lot of ways that change is causing the industry and organizations and production companies to do things differently for the first time in a very long time. So People want to know when they're getting back to work. They want to know when they're getting back to production, when new content can come on the air. And the reality is, is for that to happen, organizations are needing to do things differently, which is great. So I would say overall, hanging in there, doing well, and just like every other industry in the, in the world, adapting and adjusting to stay relevant. Great. And when you say doing things differently, more people-centric, more people-focused, would you say? Yeah, I would absolutely say more people-centric, people-focused, and then operationally as well. So when you think about writer's rooms, doing that in a virtual safe environment, making sure the health and the safety and the well-being of the writers, of the production team, of the cast and crew are all safe, making sure they're taking into consideration how people show up and get to do their best work in this new world where there are so many unknowns the implications are pretty large. Great. Well, it's interesting because a writer's room where um, shows are written in a, in a collective way or cooperative way, we should say. Mm -hmm. I hope cooperative. Uh, <laughs> so, um, in the best. Yeah, in the best show. Um, that's actually teamwork and it's all virtual. So um, how? what advice do you give to showrunners or producers about creating a, a, a good balance for that? Yeah, so right now there's a large focus on communication, listening, asking questions, and giving people the benefit of the doubt. People are connecting in a way that they've never done before, or been forced to do before. And when you're in these creative environments, they move pretty quickly or they can move pretty quickly. So making sure people are asking the questions, saying some of the things that maybe would have gone unsaid. And then when they're engaging too quickly or using the wrong language or not being their very best, giving each other the grace and the ability to um, give each other the benefit of the doubt a little, giving some people some flexibility to, to not show up in their best because people are trying so hard and then having each other communicate and talk about it in a way that gets them to a good end result. So it's really around attempting, listening, focusing, and then when things don't work, calling that time out and saying, hey, what were your intentions here? What should we be doing here moving forward? How do we think about where we go from here? Right. So often in virtual teams, the entertainment industry is likely no different. Um, the loudest voice in the room dominates. So what advice do you have for introverts? <laughs> 
Yeah, and that's the great thing about Zoom. I think you and others are saying it's Zoom and virtual meetings are a great equalizer. So it's really around making sure that there are built-in opportunities to speak up, making sure these sessions are um, created in a way that allows structure so nobody goes unsaid. Nobody is not uh, not speaking up when they have a chance. So rather than sort of that organic flow that would sometimes happen in these creative spaces, building in the structure that allows for everyone to engage in a way that gives the best diversity of thought and the work and the output that the organization or the team or the writer's room is looking for. That's great. You know, you and I have chatted about this before. And if you were to ask me about the least likely uh, business to embrace executive coaching, I probably would have said either law firms or uh, the entertainment industry. And you uh, have corrected me. So things have changed. And why? So. Yeah, you know, I, I think there have been some opportunities to do things better and the creative talent have recognized that technically, functionally, they are brilliant and they have done amazing work. And then they get to a place where now they're leading huge teams, huge shows and huge budgets and they need help. And they're OK for the first time saying, let me think about what my role means as a leader not just as a creative. And when they think about that and get to a place that they understand all leaders need help to do and be their best and push their teams to be the best, that comfort level with someone like me and the work that we do, it changes and adapts. And I'll say it's an amazing industry for networking. So I started working with one or two creative uh, leaders you know, several years ago. And now I work with their colleagues and I work with people that were on their shows 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and their friends and their writing partners and their producing partners. And it's a really good, it's a great industry for when things work, they talk about it and they share it. So a lot of change there. That's such a good story. And it reminds me of actually another discipline, and that's um, academic medicine or healthcare. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I always say that physicians, um, when they went to medical school, the one thing they didn't learn was management. But when they are in academic careers or in uh, uh, managing, uh, end up running a department or healthcare, excuse me, in a hospital, they need management and they need support. And an and executive coaching is very um, popular in, in mm-hmm. the healthcare world. So there's a similarity there. And it, and part of it is one is promoted, I would think, in the entertainment industry, as in medicine initially, through your individual achievements. You write a good script, you write a novel, or you direct a film. It's a uh, direction is a little different, but certainly if you're a writer, it's an individual achievement. And suddenly, with a and you're you know a showrunner you're managing other creatives correct so yeah absolutely so managing other creatives and i would say in the last three to four years, the change with uh, the creative leadership at the top is recognizing that it's their responsibility to help other creatives develop as leaders as well. So before, I think that technical expertise really kind of elevated you into the next level of Um, involvement within a a production company or show or or a script or something to that extent. And now I I think more of these leaders in those top spots, those creative leaders are saying, it is my responsibility to help these writers, to help these creative talented folks be and do their best work, which means I need to focus on things like management. I need to focus on helping them build things like how to give feedback, how to be and hold their teams accountable, and how to manage time, delegation, and responsibility. Because these are the things that allow this creative talent to be their best, and they've had to learn it in very different ways, and I'll say non-traditional ways, and they, they recognize that it's time to sort of shake things up and change the development pipeline for other creatives that are coming up behind them. And that has been amazing to watch. You know, the, the classic thing in, in management is you are promoted because typically you're a very good individual contributor. And then suddenly when you move into management, you need to take a step back because you're learning to, to manage and delegate and all that. How does that work? How do you, because uh, I've always seen a little bit of a hiccup in science in mm-hmm. pharma. And I would guess in the entertainment industry too, because what got you to your career is that you are a brilliant writer. Uh, Am I correct? So, yeah, absolutely. But like any profession, you once you're leading, whether it's a show or a film or a production company, 
you're responsible to get work done through others. So you recognize really quickly that what, what you've been doing to get to the place that you're at won't work and isn't sustainable if you want to have the success that you've worked your entire career for. So again, how do I get that work done through others? How do I develop the people around me? How do I provide them feedback so they can grow and think differently? How do I create the culture that allows whatever this project we're working on to be sustainable for years to come in a very real way? Great. Are the young creatives coming up now, are they expecting feedback and development? So, Yeah, so it's interesting. So they're expecting it and surprised by it, right? So I think in terms of their career trajectory, right, they have been given more feedback throughout their life when I think of earlier career creatives meaning in university, within the school systems, things to that extent. And they also recognize that historically in the industry, not a lot of feedback is provided in the way that we would think about feedback in, in other corporate environments. Right. So when their leaders are engaging in feedback in a more traditional way, they're a little surprised. So it takes a little bit of reconciliation to go, okay, this is what I want and this is what I need. And here's what the leader is willing to give me. And it feels really great but it's outside of the norm. So how do I adapt and adjust to that? Great. What trends, if there are, are, are shaping leadership and management in the entertainment world? Kind of a throwing you a fast pitch right down the middle. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, so I think in terms of the trends is, yeah, that there is an expectation that as a creative that you do need to lead and you're going to be held accountable to it and it's going to help drive the success of whatever it is you're working on. So many, you know, successful executives and our friend Marshall Goldsmith did a book on that. And you, you uh, virtually said this word, these words, well, got you, what got you here won't get you there. So what kind of obstacles do you see for se senior managers running a, uh, enterprises that, in which you coach? So. Yeah. So a couple of things right now um, that I, I would highlight. So one that is consistent regarding pre-COVID, post-COVID, which is making sure they don't get in their own way. So when you think about leadership, we tend to find ways to get in our own way, whether that's self-doubt, whether that's lack of confidence, whether that's being the leader we know and want to be. All of those things are things that you need to work past. Um, and that's things that I help leaders think through in a, in a, in a way that helps you know, continue their trajectory forward. And then I'll say right now in this post-COVID world, it's about sustainability. Right now, leaders are tired. They're, t they're tired. So at first it was, how do I get through this new world, which is this COVID environment? How do I think about restructuring my organization? How do I think about the changes that are necessary to keep the business um, moving forward in this time? And then you add on top of that some of the social movements that have continued to happen. And then you add on that the change that's continuing to go back with COVID, people not understanding or knowing when they're going back to the office or not returning to the office. And all of these things have just piled on. So when leadership was hard before, it's really hard right now when you think about what we've asked of leaders and what we continue to ask of leaders and how long we're going to ask that of leaders. That's, I'm, I'm glad you used the word or that phrase very hard because it is. And I think one of the contributing factors to that being very hard is isolation. Do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, yeah, I absolutely do. So isolation, being on their own, not engaging, not having the collaboration, and then also knowing that what their employees need from them is transparency and trust and consistency and trying to figure out how to do that in a virtual world. So in this world where everything is changing, we know that there needs to be that connection for our employees to stay engaged and motivated and trust that what we're doing for the organization is best for them and best for the business. Business. And it's really hard in that isolative state. And leaders are struggling with that because they know what their employees need. They know what their teams need. And they're not able to engage and exec uh, um, execute that in the same way they've always done. So it's a real, really, really big curve for most folks right now. That's, I can see that. You mentioned, you mentioned something earlier that um, I find intriguing. And you talked about overcoming self-doubt. And doubt is a topic I've explored. And um, do you ever see an advantage to doubt? So. 
Yeah, I do. So I, I think there is a component of self-doubt that allows some leaders to be more open to ask and receive feedback. So if they're not quite sure how they're being perceived in terms of their own intentionality, sometimes they're more interested and willing to have those conversation, which gives them better insight to how they show up and leads ultimately to a little bit more confidence and in, in, in sort of managing that self-doubt in a different way. Do you say that it's okay to feel uh, doubt? I mean, uh, Oh, absolutely. And what I say to people is everybody feels it, whether they admit it or not. And then there's a huge sigh of relief when they know they're not alone. Yeah. And I think in a way that's akin to the imposter syndrome, would it not be? So, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and I was talking to a friend the other day that I, all of us have need to have uh, a little bit of imposter syndrome in us. And if we don't, we're just jerks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'd agree with that. <laughs> Ambition um, is, the, is, is, a, uh, is a powerful motivator. Every leader needs it. But when it comes to women, um, ambition is perceived as or negative. It marginalizes women. Have you encountered that in your coaching? And if so, how do you deal with it? So. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing that I do when I'm working with a female leader, whether she's in the position or inspiring to be in that position, is I say, own it. Own that ambition. Own what got you here. Be very clear about who you want to be and how you want to lead. Put a plan in place that's consistent with that. Create language and then go execute because that's what's going to keep you leading in a way that uh, attributes to that growth that you're looking for. And when you say create language, what does that mean? So. Yeah. So who? what's your brand as a leader? How do you want to show up? What do you stand for? Have some consistent messaging. And part of that can be, you know, part of that for most women is ambition. Have consistent messaging around that right. and put it out there. Right. So often, though, our culture... Um, pushes women. And so that if they do, we've seen in our political process that when we say one a female candidate is ambitious, we never say that about in a kind of pejorative sense, a, a, a male politician who's perceived as ambitious, well, he's a go-getter. But as a woman, he's a leader. <laughs> yes. He's a, and a woman, it's just the opposite. And so yeah. um, one of the things about it, and our colleague Jennifer um, McCollum uh, wrote, uh, I quoted her in an article about it, and she said, um, it's up to organizations to change. So it's not up to women to change. So do you ever get involved in the structural uh, to advise companies on their organizational changes as it regards to equality in the workplace. So Yeah, so a little bit in terms of an organizational perspective from a structural perspective. So more around how do we create the culture, but then I've had a chance to do a lot of work with ERGs, um, employee resource groups. And a lot of that work has happened with the women led groups. And it goes back to exactly that same messaging. Be clear about your intention in terms of who you are, how you show up, what you want to be in this organization, what is the culture that you want to create, and then own and drive it and be consistent. Great. Do you ever do role plays with um, women leaders to help them get their feet on the ground that way? Or so. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. Uh, and it's always interesting. I, I find myself, correcting is too strong of a word, but asking the question, why are you apologizing? <laughs> so you just gave some tough feedback that was good for the business and good for this leader. And then you're closing it out with, now, I'm sorry if that came across as harsh. That wasn't my intention, but I want you to be your best. That's something our uh, Sally Helgeson, our colleague, talks about and wrote about and how women rise. It's yeah. kind of a, apology syndrome that's kind of one step forward, then a half step back. And it's done with the best intention, but it doesn't help. Yeah. And that's the other piece when there's role plays. Sometimes the leader will practice, you know, as we're playing, you know, as we're rolling, role playing it, they'll practice and they'll say something brilliant that is right on par. And then they're apologetic or they dismiss it or they they say something to kind of let it be, you know, it takes it down to not just from that strong statement that it was to, yeah, here we go. Um, hopefully you like what I have to say here. Yeah, that's right. Whereas when it comes to men, it's, hey, what I just said is absolutely brilliant. I have yeah. no doubt of that. And, yeah, uh, I, I've worked with some amazing women over the last, you know, 20 
20 years. And um, it, it's great to see how far they've come and their confidence in owning their own messaging and their confidence in driving the business in a very real way. And, and to be completely honest with you, I can't wait to see what the next five years looks like. Oh, no, it's, it is exciting. And you, you are helping um, women uh, find their way play in a challenging industry. And I think you're obviously because you work with so many men doing the same for them. So what's the projection for where we're going to be next year? Do you that anything, any percept, uh, perspective you can share? Um, yeah, yeah. So I think when we think about leadership over the next year, we have all been, and the leaders that I've worked with have been forced to adapt. They have been forced to think differently and they've been forced to make really tough decisions that have really large implications on organizations, individual and people that they care about. So when I think about where we'll be for the next year, my hope is that we'll all be a little bit better. I think we've been forced to change in a way that um, causes us all, and I think it goes back to the name of your of your show, it causes us all to find grace differently and find grace that's meaningful to us, and hopefully that translates to the organization. So when I think about where leaders will be in a year, I think we'll all be a little bit better. That's a, that's a good concept. I, one of my little themes in the book, in my book, Grace, is I talk about focus on better. And it's you define better what it means for you as a better colleague, a better spouse, a better friend, a better whatever, and then yeah. act on that. So Yeah. You know, I, I would say those first six weeks, eight weeks after people started um staying and sheltering in place after COVID, I had seen more career defining moments of leadership in those six, eight weeks than I had probably seen in the last five to seven years. Can you give us an example of a career, what you're calling career defining leadership? So, um, yeah, yeah. So one organization that I was working with had really tough decisions to make around people, locations, office buildings, impact on revenue and ultimately got to a place where they decided what we care about is the health, safety, well-being of our employees for the sustainable future. And with that, we're going to shut the doors momentarily, figure out how we can regroup, take the hit, keep people healthy and well, do this in a very concise way, and then bring everybody back. That was a really tough decision to make because the, the, the incremental loss was substantial and real, but they're back on track. They're doing great. Their numbers are brilliant, but that leader had to be really brave. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great story. And it, it takes courage. Um, huge amounts of courage, huge amounts of courage still to this day where when I say, can you believe you did that? Yeah. Uh, this individual just gives me a big laugh. One of the things we think about, we're going to end up with my word, a hybrid workplace. Some of us are going to be in an office and some are going to be working from home, probably more at home. And that works for office jobs, even writing, I think, as virtual. But then there's in the entertainment industry, there is production. So mm. what are you seeing production wise? Is, is it even is it even feasible? So. Yeah, I think um, studios are, are still trying to figure it out and it's yet to be determined in a lot of ways. There is a need for content. People that are staying in place, traveling less, you know, one of their one of their pleasures right now is the introduction of new content. So there's a need for it. And I think that the industry is adaptable and innovative enough that they're going to figure it out. And some are sort of leading the charge on that. Uh, but it's it's still a little early, I think, to be determined. I had this little idea where I'm, we meet regularly with friends um, on the on weekends and for socially distant or, or physically distant cocktails. And I was just thinking of a, a drawing room. I hope it's a comedy about, I can see multiple scenes only from October, November, December, each one of those months as they go by. <laughs> and what, you know, you start out with it's kind of fun and nouveau, but after six months, this is a really boring, <laughs> So and um, anyway, it's 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 funny that way. That's so, probably true for all of us, right? I mean, this was very exciting. 
<laughs> for each family at the beginning. And now we're like, oh, we're ready to go back to the real world. We, yeah. And you touched on the key word there. And um, you are a mother and you have I am. four at home, three who are being homeschooled or virtually schooled. So how's that going, Lacey? <laughs> you know, it's an adventure every day. And I've made a really large commitment to myself and to my family that we're all going to work hard to put the joy and find the joy in each day and recognize the gifts that this is, which is family dinners and more time together and reading out loud and, and playing games. And it's really hard and not so fun all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine, you know, I mean, especially for parents, this is less about, I mean, uh, you're marvelous and you're a terrific mom and doing everything. But it's, do you ever talk to other parents about this, you know, with kids at home? What are the stresses they're feeling? I mean, they're demanding job and the kids, and they're educating kids. Does yeah. that dynamic ever come up? So, Yeah, absolutely. So most of the leaders that I work with have children and most are school aged. Uh, and it's about finding that balance and making sure people know that they let themselves off the hook, right? We are all just doing our best and we're doing our best from a business perspective and we're doing our best from a family perspective and an education perspective. And it is okay and our kids will be just fine and they are resilient. So figure out what is going to bring you joy in this, in this time, what's going to bring your kids joy and this opportunity in this time and let yourself off the hook. You're doing the very best you can. That's such a war, um, heartwarming concept, I'll say. And I like the idea of say, doing your best because when we get, I often apply it to decision-making, you know, um, I don't know, they, whatever the paradigm is, it's uh, 50, you know, you, you have 50% of the facts and 50% unknown, or is it 80, 20, whatever, it's variable. I think when you make those, pull those big decisions, you have to know that I made, I made the best decision I could with the information I had. And then life goes forward. It may have been the wrong decision, but it wasn't intentional that you made the wrong decision. Maybe, you know, it, it worked out that way. So I, I like the way that you talked about you did okay. You did yeah. your best. And yeah. I think we all need that reassurance. So. Yeah. And one of the messages around those decisions is if it didn't go the way you wanted or intended it to go or it wasn't the optimal solution, how are you going to learn from it? And how are you going to do better next time? Right. And that's what our friend Tasha Yurek talks about is moving from the why yeah. to the what. OK, so rather than saying, or well, why are the schools closed and say, and we know what the reasons are, well, what will I do about it? Or yeah. why did I do that? OK, it's done. What will I do about it? And that's yeah. such a powerful lesson. So, yeah. What are the components that I have control over? Right? Yes. Uh, I, I can control that my children aren't so frustrated every day that they're crying all day looking at the screen, right? Yeah. I can control that by my attitude. I control that by the way we're looking at it. I control that by the level of, of pressure I'm dismissing, you know, I'm taking away from them because believe me, they all are, are, are frustrated as well. But what can I do to control the situation? And I think that's the same for decisions in work. And that's the same decision for decisions in the family and the home right now um, in this crazy new world. Right. But I know that your boys have a particular avocation related to rocks. So that will <laughs> move them forward. <laughs> yeah. So we haven't thrown any at each other recently. So we're doing very well. Now they're just studying them and enjoying them. So it's rocks and bugs right now. Rocks and bugs. Oh, that's great. Um, Lacey, I always like to ask people about a moment of grace that they experienced or either for themselves or for others. Is there a moment you'd like to share? So. Yeah, yeah. And I'll, and I'll go um, post COVID again. So I, as an executive coach, in a lot of ways, I am tasked with help helping leaders move businesses forward or helping leaders move teams forward. And as you know, as that March 15th, and those first couple of weeks of COVID and staying sheltering in place came to place, I got on the phone and got on virtual zooms with leaders, and still wanted to have the same kind of conversations. How, what's, what are you doing? What are you trying to accomplish? How are we going to get there? What are the implications? What does this mean to the business? And so on and so forth. And then I had a moment where I said, I am not doing and being my best for the leaders that I work with. And this is really hard for them. So I changed that, those conversations to, how are you? Are you doing all right? Talk to me a little bit about what's going on right now. 
And then we would connect it to the business. But the relief that people felt when asked, are you all right? How are you? You hanging in there? Was a huge learning for me. And it reminds me, you know, my goal, my intention is to meet people where they're at, regardless of what that looks like. And in this world and in this moment, um, that's helping them think about you know, what is their reality and can they hang in there and what does that look like to the business and doing that in a kinder, softer way. And we're still getting the work done, but people know that they're cared about and people know that they'll get to the other side in a real way. What a lovely story. And again, um, it is imbued with grace. And there's another form of grace that you show. And that's, in your words, uh, meeting people where they are. And that's our role as coaches. You know, um, uh, we don't have all the answers, <laughs> although sometimes we're expected to or whatever. But um, our responsibility is to, to help our clients succeed and, and meet them where they are so they can get to where they want to go. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Lacey, you've been a terrific guest. So um, how can people find you? So. Yeah. So feel free to shoot me an email at Lacey at LLMCG.com or uh, on LinkedIn. It's Lacey Leone McLaughlin or my website, which is LLMCG. Great. Uh, Lacey, you've been a graceful guest. So thank, thank you. you. And we will close out. So 